Well, it's good to be back again on this Wednesday evening. As you know, we've got this mini series going on in the evenings at the moment called Repercussions of the Resurrection. I apologise for that being a virtual tongue twister. I guess it's slightly better than uh, the rascal running around the ragged rocks or rugged rocks, whatever it is. But this is our series at the moment. Last week, Clive did a great talk about the road to Emmaus. The week before that, I did a talk about the promised Holy Spirit. And today, I'm back again, as I said, and we're, the talk is going to be on from empty to full. From empty to full, based on John 21, verses 1 to 14. So the series is Repercussions of the Resurrection, and tonight's talk is called from empty to full, from John 21. So I hope that will be of real interest to you. Now, I've said before in the past how much I really like the book of John. The book of John is like a literary masterpiece. It's absolutely brilliant. When you, when you look at it, you, you kind of see this theological thread and linkage going through every part of the book. What's at the start is at the beginning, what's at the beginning is at the start, there it is in the middle, in between, this sort of thread running through of this brilliant theology about who Jesus really, really is. And so as we come to this service tonight, I want to look at some of those threads that are relevant to John 21. And the other thing tonight is I want this to be a communion service as you'll have already been told on the email. And so what I'm going to try and do is have a reflective type service with a communion, having talked about this passage first. Now, as you can appreciate, having a reflective service with no actual audience is hard. But as always, I'll try my best. So I really hope that I'll be able to draw out some really special things about our Lord. Let's pray, shall we, for a few moments. Father God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ given to the world. And we thank you that he died and he rose again. And we want to thank you that in this amazing passage from John 21, where 153 fish were caught into a, a net that did not break, where you, Jesus, were on the shore and were close to your disciples once more at that time. We pray that we might be close to you today and we would know you once more in a fresh and new way. Lord, we ask this in and through the power of your Holy Spirit for the glory of your name. Amen. Now, what I want to do is recount chapter 21, verses 1 to 14, and just go through some of the most salient points, because I want to pick up on those later on in the rest of my talk. So at this point, they already knew Jesus was alive and risen from the dead. John, Peter, Mary, they'd all seen the empty tomb. Later, Thomas, who was often called Doubting Thomas, he saw Jesus' wounds, he touched them, and he said, my Lord and my God, finally, he too believed. The disciples were very aware that Christ was risen from the dead. And that was an amazing thing. Can you imagine being there at that moment and actually seeing the risen Christ? And they had. But then by chapter 21, they'd got to this stage where perhaps a few days had passed and they hadn't seen Jesus in, in, in a while. And they were perhaps a bit unsure in themselves. This was a massive moment. He'd gone from being dead to suddenly being alive. And they were trying to get their heads around that. And so they were by the shore, Lake Tiberius, commonly known as Lake Galilee. And they were by this shore. And perhaps they didn't really quite know what to do with themselves. So verse 3, Peter says, I'm going to go and fish. 
I guess Peter was in a pretty bad state of mind. He'd just denied his Lord three times back in chapter 18. Denied knowing Jesus. Do any of us know how he really felt in those moments and after, even now at chapter 21? I think often when we're struggling, we can return back to old habits, to default modes, our coping strategies, if you like. So with Peter feeling like he did, maybe perhaps he thought, all I've got is fishing. So he went back to fishing, what he knew, what he'd always done. And what he did was really what fishermen of that time always did. They fished at night. It was generally, the understanding was generally that the best time to fish was at night. And even today, we still have that in our time. So he went out fishing and the rest of the disciples decided to go with him. And we know what happened. They caught absolutely nothing. Fishing all night and caught nothing. And then suddenly someone spoke to them. At that point, it was a complete stranger, someone standing on the shore. Verse five, this stranger says, friends, haven't you any fish? And then he says, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Verse six. And then the miracle, or rather the sign, as John calls it, happens. The net suddenly was full and too large to haul onto the boat. And I'm going to be honest here. I think Peter was an extremely rugged, strong man. He was a real tough nut. And there he was with the rest of them struggling to get this net with the fish in on board the boat. And as I said a few minutes ago, there's 153 large fish in the net. Verse 11 makes that clear. And then in that moment, John, the disciple who Jesus loved, said, It is the Lord. Can you imagine the passion? It is the Lord. And then Simon Peter, probably just as you know, vigorous as he always was and impetuous, jumps into the water and swims as hard as he can to get to Jesus, leaving his mates behind, following in the boat, sort of towing the load, verse 8. And then, verse 12, they had breakfast with Jesus. Breakfast with Jesus. And in fact, he actually served them, did Jesus, with some fish and some bread. Actually, Jesus also had some fish and bread of his own already by the time they got there. But he also used some of theirs as well and made this meal, simple meal, and served his fellow disciples. And in those moments, they knew again that the stranger who was on the shore was indeed the risen and resurrected Christ. Let's have a look at some of these little parallels I'd like to bring out now. So they'd gone fishing at night. Well, earlier I mentioned threads and little linkages. Well, I'm sure many of you know that Nicodemus, back in John 3 verse 2, went to see Jesus at night. He went at night because he was afraid of what his fellow Pharisees might think of him. But that phrase, at night, also means there was a spiritual blindness and darkness to Nicodemus because he was not a true believer. They'd gone fishing, as I said, at night. And maybe the point here is this, that actually disciples need to realise that since Christ was risen from the dead, they were no longer of the night. They were of the day. They were no longer of darkness. They were of light. They no longer were people who could not see, but actually were able to fully see. They were a people of spiritual light and sight. 
That is a repercussion of the resurrection. Once you know Christ has risen and you truly believe, you enter into light and sight. And maybe this is what they were gradually beginning to realise. Indeed, when they caught that load of fish at Jesus' command, I wonder if they remembered John 6 verses 1 to 15 when Jesus fed the 5,000 people with the two small fish and the five barley loaves. It says in that passage that eight months of wages could not have fed all those people. But with an astonishing act of power, Jesus fed every single one of them. Amazing, amazing miracle, an amazing sign. Jesus pointing to who he really is once again. And in fact, there were 12 baskets of bread left over. Surely 12 probably refers to the 12 tribes of Israel. So in so doing, Jesus is saying that I am the full provision to the people of Israel, to Jewish people and indeed to Gentile people. Whoever believes on Jesus has this provision, this fullness given to him. Jesus is a Jewish Messiah and salvation comes from the Jews, John 4, 22, and it is for all alike. Now, the interesting thing is, when Jesus fed the crowd, he only had two small fish. Here in John 21, we've got 153 large fish, so large, they can't even get it onto the boat. So here's the thought that I had. In their own strength, these disciples could catch nothing, even after trying all night long. But with Jesus, they could catch everything. Absolutely everything. So a repercussion of the resurrection is then, I guess, total extravagant abundance with the Lord supplying all we need in and through him. But what I spotted in the text, which is quite interesting, is the fact the net did not break. I mean, it's extraordinary with all those fish. It didn't break. Whereas back in Luke 5 verses 1 to 11, the net then did break. So maybe a repercussion of the resurrection is this, that the gospel net is big enough and strong enough to catch and keep all who enter into it. It will not break, for the Lord's resurrection power is enough for all. Indeed, this would also fulfil what Jesus said to his disciples back in Mark 1.17, that he would make them fishers of men. And that's what they went on to do. Fishers of men, bring people into the gospel and into the gospel net that will not break. And here's an extra thing that I thought you might be interested in. 153 fish. 153 is actually a perfect triangle number. So it, it draws a perfect triangle, 153. I wondered if that was an allusion to Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Well, chapter 6 is pretty important, I think, for understanding chapter 21, which we're looking at. And I've already mentioned chapter 6 with reference to Jesus feeding the 5,000 and the two small fish and the five barley loaves. But here's something else from chapter 6. Jesus walked on the water, as did Peter, of course. And I was talking about that the other day on the Sunday morning service, although from a different chapter, different book and chapter to this. But let's just think perhaps for a moment again about some of those things. In chapter six, we've got the walking on the water. And in that moment, Jesus demonstrates that he is God and that he is absolutely in charge of everything. He has authority over all things, including the forces of nature. So it shouldn't surprise us then that he can command a load of fish just to appear off the side of a boat when he wants to. And where did those fish appear? On the right hand side of the boat. And I wondered, right hand side, Jesus is now at the right hand of God, the place of authority 
as God the Son. So I wondered if there was another interesting thing just there. But more than that, John 6 is even more profound because Jesus said of himself, did he not? I am the bread of life. John 6 verse 48. He fed the 5,000 with bread, but only a few verses later, he's saying, I am the actual real bread. Maybe then as Jesus ate bread with his disciples, they perhaps remembered those words. Of course, the difference is, is that the physical food they were eating would eventually run out and would spoil like any food does. But Jesus as that food, he himself endures to eternal life, John 6, 27. Jesus is the bread, the manna that comes down from heaven above. He is real food and he is real drink, John 6, 55. And in John 6, 51, Jesus says, I am the living bread. Now, I don't know if many of you remember from ages ago, I mentioned that word living. Living there is not bios, as in physical life, you know, which is where we get the word biology from. It's not bios life. Everybody who's alive has got physical life. This is the zoe life, the zoe life. It's where we get the name zoe from, the zoe, zoe life. And that is a word that's used specifically to do with full and complete spiritual life. And we only get that from Jesus. So he's the living zoe, complete spiritual life bread. That's another repercussion of the resurrection. And so they sat round the fire, glowing embers and a small flame. A small charcoal fire was also lit when Peter denied Christ back in John 18, 18. But a glowing embers, small flame, Jesus in contrast is the greatest flame of all because he fulfills those four blazing torches from the tabernacle's feast for he truly is the light of the world shining out not just in Jerusalem but to everybody and anybody John 8 12 and Peter you know impetuous as I said he, he's in the boat and he jumps out but before he jumps out he wraps around himself this outer garment before he gets in the water and swims like mad to get to the shoreline to see Jesus. But the interesting thing there for wrapping around the outer garment, the same verb used for wrapping round there is the same verb that Jesus used to tie the towel around himself when he washed his disciples' feet in John 13. So Jesus served his disciples then in John 13, but on the shore he's now serving them once more with giving them a simple breakfast. Yes, so Jesus is concerned with our spiritual strength, but he also matters to him about our physical strength. They'd been fishing all night long. They were hungry. I think it's a precious thing to know that God is also interested in our physical well-being and not just our spiritual. A few minutes ago, I said that Jesus had some fish and bread of his own before they actually got to the shore with their massive catch. And for me, that shows how self-sufficient he really is. He doesn't really need anything from anybody else because he is God. He's so capable on his own. And I think that's reassuring because it means we can rely on him. And when we've run out of everything of ourselves, he's always got enough. But he did take some of their fish. He did use it for the food. And I thought that was such a nice thing in the text because... It shows that Jesus takes what we have. He uses the things that we give him as we do it rightly in and through him and for his glory. So he takes what we offer him. Ironically, I know he's the one who provides it in the first place, certainly the case here with their fish. But it's good to know he takes what we have and takes us as we are. And actually, I think that's highlighted by verse five. Jesus called them friends. What a, what a lovely word. And it's quite a unique word because actually it could be translated as 
lads or something like that. And so when you think about that, there's Peter. He's denied the Lord and he's he's struggling in himself. But even then, Jesus includes him in the term lads, in the term friends. Peter, in spite of knowing what he's done, when he recognises that Jesus is the Lord, as we know, he jumps into the water. So he's thinking within himself somewhere, somehow Jesus will accept me back. And later, in some later verses, Jesus does reinstate him in that proper way. But, you know, the thing that struck me was this time, Peter, he didn't really mind if he fell deep into the water or walked on it because he knew the resurrection told him that Christ had power whether he sunk in it or walked on it or swam in it. I think that's what the repercussion of the resurrection meant for Peter in that moment. So these disciples, perhaps they were feeling empty, but to use the title of our sermon, they were now full, full again, filled up further by seeing Jesus and seeing him in his resurrection again. And finally, here's a thought about verse one. You didn't think I'd miss out verse one, did you? Well, here's verse one. It reads there, Jesus appeared. That's what the NIV translates it as. The word appear is actually a lot stronger than that. It literally means Jesus revealed himself. Jesus shone himself forth. He manifested himself in a light-like way. It's where we get the word epiphany from. So this is Jesus' epiphania. He appears, manifests in that kind of way, which is quite extraordinary rather than just a more general appearing. And so my hope is that as we take communion now, you would hear the Lord call you friend. I mean, dare we even think that he would say that to us? But he might, and he just might. Maybe today we feel perhaps we're a bit like a Peter, a Thomas, a John, a Martha, a Mary, a someone. But I want to say, whatever character you are or how you may feel you are or compare yourself to to a person even to people in the bible i want to say the lord calls you by your name because he's the great shepherd so he's calling you because you are you and as we take this bread and the wine perhaps we can remember some of the things i've said perhaps we can just allow ourselves just to have that incredible kind of awe at who he is because there's so much about him as we've seen in this passage today and I hope this will be an epiphany for you for me as we take the communion together this will be a moment where something fresh of Christ shines forth he appears manifests reveals something himself to you and to me perhaps in a way we've not known for a long time or for a while So maybe if you're feeling a bit empty, you might find some new fullness today. Let's take our communion together, shall we?